we have a funny scene in our first reading. One Israelite prophet challenging 450 prophets of Baal. Well, actually, in the earlier part of the chapter, he also spoke about another 400 prophets of Asherah. That makes them 850 in all. And the one surviving prophet of Israel is challenging all of these Baal prophets into something like a jewel. The king of Israel, whose name is Ahab, had already abandoned the faith and turned to the Canaanite fertility gods, Baal and Asherah. Baal, the god of heaven, and Asherah, the goddess of earth. Well, Ahab, King Ahab and his wife, Queen Jezebel, had ordered the massacre of all the prophets of Israel, and only one remained, the prophet Elijah. You know, I imagine him looking a bit like Gandalf. He had been in hiding until God instructed him to come out and to confront the king. And so he turned himself in, but not without a fight. In today's reading, from the first book of Kings, chapter 18, Elijah is challenging the fake prophets to a different kind of marathon. He said, pray to your gods, and I will pray to Yahweh, my God, and we'll see who of us will be heard. Just a little explanation about this Baal religion. You know, this Canaanite fertility religion had become very popular to the Israelite men because it legitimized their infidelity to their wives. They were made to believe that in order to make the earth fertile, they had to ritualize the union between Baal, the father god of heaven, and Asherah, the mother goddess of earth. How do they do that? They hire a temple prostitute for sex. And this was done as a religious duty, believing that it was the only way to get their fields to become fruitful. And they called it sacred prostitution. Now back to the Elijah challenge. Elijah the prophet tells the Baal prophets to do what they are used to doing. They dance, they leap around on one foot, they circulate around the altar while chanting and shouting. They even had a strange practice of inducing a trance by making little cuts on their skin, on their bodies, literally making themselves bleed. And the author says, nothing happens. Twice, the author says, there was no voice, meaning God could not be heard to, through these prophets because they were fake. Oh, there are fake prophets. They were a bunch of fakes who would do whatever was pleasing to the king. They pretended to pray as if grace depended on their gimmicks, their rituals, their techniques, their sacrifices, and the combination of their words. And what do they obtain from this? Nothing. Remember, Jesus once said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 7, When you pray, do not babble like the pagans, because, you know, they think they will be heard on account of their many words or their combination of words. In short, Jesus is saying, you don't manipulate God or treat God like a puppet on a string, or like a jukebox that plays a tune for you when you drop a coin in it? Elijah the prophet 
did not do anything like that. When it was his turn, all he did was to call on the name of the Lord. And fire descended upon the altar and burnt up the offerings. Fire. Beautiful symbol. You know, I feel sorry that for us Catholics, many, for many Catholics, fire symbolizes hell. Fire is a beautiful symbol in the scriptures. The Lord appeared in a burning bush. Pentecost is about tongues of fire descending on the disciples. So when Solomon built the temple, a perpetual fire was made to burn in the innermost sanctum of the temple, which was called the Holy of Holies. Actually, our vigil lamps in our Catholic parishes are a remnant of that tradition of the perpetual fire of the temple. It had to be kept burning by the priests. And part of the duty of the priest was to stoke this fire to make sure it was perpetually bur burning. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. The symbolism is quite evident. The fire of the divine presence. It is what people come to the temple for in order to find light in their dark situations, in order to seek warmth in the cold, in order to be transformed, in order to be purified like gold that is tested by fire. Inside the temple, in the tabernacle of the Holy of Holies, there was the Ark of the Covenant. And inside the box, I mentioned this many weeks ago, they placed two stone tablets of the law. They are the tablets of the law that Jesus is talking about in today's gospel. He didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And remember how we heard this a few days ago, how Jesus had summarized the Jewish law into two. Love of God above all and love of neighbor as oneself. That is how he intends to fulfill it. Many people reacted. Reacted to Jesus's, what they, Jesus, to what they regarded as an oversimplification by Jesus. They would react and say, is he abolishing the law? Well, today in the gospel, he answers that. And he says, no, no. I came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. In the words of the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 31, God says, in the new covenant that I will establish, I will write my law no longer on stone tablets. I will write my law in their hearts. The Lord eventually allowed this temple of stone to be demolished so that we could become ourselves the temple. When our hearts are aflame with the love of God and neighbor, that is when we become the temple of God and we fulfill the prophecy of Jeremiah. And so we end with a question. How should we pray? Well, let go of the gimmick. It is not what you do for God that matters in your prayer. It is rather what you allow God to do for you and to do through you. Like the prophet Elijah, go rather for the simplicity of disposing your heart to trust in God like a child and trusting himself totally in the hands of his father. When you can pray as if everything depended on God, then you can work as if everything depended on you.